Hello, I would like to welcome everyone to our study that we are starting today, an 11-week study titled, Who is This Jesus? I hope everyone is able to log on to their computers, their televisions, all right, to be able to see uh, this study. This is certainly a different format, not being able to be with you, but I pray this will go smoothly as we work together in this study. You will need a Bible with you as we do this study together. In particular, I would invite you to take your Bible and open it up to the Gospel of John, John chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 18 today. It's very interesting when you look at all four of the Gospel writers. They record 270 events, miracles, and teachings during Jesus' earthly ministry. And what's so interesting is you learn so much about God when you read all four Gospels together as compared to just reading one. If you were only to read one of the Gospels, you certainly get an understanding of who Jesus is and what he has uh, done for us. But it's you get such a, a much better, more complete picture of Jesus when you go through all four Gospels. So that is what I want us to do together, is to uh, look at all four Gospels over the, the next 11 weeks to see their perspective as to how they saw Jesus based on their experiences, based on who they spoke to, uh, based on some of their, their backgrounds and the time they spent with Jesus. I will invite you that you may uh, type in comments to uh, let, people, let people know that you're here. I can see that some people are typing in some comments. This is great to be able to uh, see. I can actually even include that chat box here for all of you to see as people are starting to type in uh, that people are here. So I want to be able to do that with you so you can see some of the comments. Or if people, if you have questions, I invite you to type those in. And uh, this way everyone can see the question. Uh, so this way I don't always have to necessarily repeat the questions, but it's great uh, seeing uh, so all of you here and joining us here this morning. So again, we are in the gospel. We're going to start in the Gospel of John, but I want to give you some background on all four of the Gospels uh, before we we get into uh, into John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There's a sheet of paper that I sent emailed to all of you. Uh, it's hard, kind of an outline for our study together. So I invite you to uh, either pull up that outline for you to use, or you can print that off. And the question number one: Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They are known as synoptic. Gospels, synoptic Gospels, which means they have a common view. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all took a similar approach in their writings about Jesus. They, they present their views on Jesus in what I call kind of a running, running video format, in that um, their books are written in chronological order. They all recount the life, the death, and resurrection of Jesus in basically the same way. Matthew, in particular, was also known as Levi. He was one of Jesus' 12 disciples, and he was a tax collector. He was writing his book primarily to Jews to help them to understand that Jesus came from the line of David. And so, indeed, he is the Savior of the world. And so, Matthew begins his book with the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1, tracing Jesus' genealogy, going all the way back to David and to Abraham. Also, uh, Matthew uh, has the most references to Old Testament prophecies and to miracles. Why did Matthew record that more than any other writer? Again, it was to, to show that indeed Jesus was the Savior of the world, and the Jews would have been very familiar with those Old Testament prophecies and with the miracles that had been prophesied about in the Old Testament. Mark wrote his book to Gentiles, namely to Romans. It's the second gospel, but what's interesting is that Mark's gospel is widely viewed as being the first one that was written. It's the shortest of the four gospels. Now, if Mark was the first one written, why wasn't his book placed first in the New Testament? We don't necessarily know. My guess is since Matthew started with the genealogy, 
at the start of his writing. That's why Matthew's book was put first in the New Testament. Mark did not get into Jesus' uh, birth. His um, uh, he, he didn't get into a lot of the early background in, in information. Uh, he didn't spend time going through Jesus' genealogy. His is the action gospel. He starts right away with John the Baptist has appeared on the scene to announce to the nation of Israel that they are to repent, a Savior is coming. Mark then says Jesus was baptized, he was tempted in the wilderness, and then Mark kind of gets going with his book as he starts going through the miracles, the parables, the teachings, the events of Jesus' life. Very action-oriented. Luke wrote his uh, book to Gentiles, namely to Greeks. And he traces Jesus' genealogy in what I would call kind of a historical context, taking Jesus' genealogy, which actually he starts in chapter 3 of his book, all the way back to Adam. Luke wrote his book to a man named Theophilus. We don't know a whole lot about this man, but apparently he had been learning some things about Jesus, and Luke wanted to confirm to him that indeed Jesus is the Savior and everything you've been taught about Jesus is indeed true. Luke was a physician. Uh, he uh, traveled with, with Paul on many of his missionary journeys. And uh, so that also Luke wrote the book of Acts. So he wrote his own gospel, Luke, and he wrote the book of Acts. Also, by the way, Mark's name is, is also, his real name is, is John Mark. And he was one who traveled many times with Peter. And uh, he was often known as Peter's secretary. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke all write their books from, from in kind of the same way, kind of this ongoing video uh, that takes place in chronological order with the, the birth, the life, the death uh, of Jesus. John takes a very different approach. With Mark's gospel most likely had been written, written first, Many people believe that Matthew and Luke then used Mark's gospel as a basis for writing their own as to maybe what stories they would include and would not include. So most people believe that John then probably saw Matthew, Mark, and Luke's writings and said, now I'm going to write this in a very different way. I can see the stories that these guys have recorded, and so I'm going to take a, a rather different approach. And John's book is written to people who... I think he feels already have some knowledge about God. John's book is written more like a photo album in that he kind of spends time on different things uh, in Jesus' life so he, we can kind of sit and see them, and John gets into a lot of the details uh, of them as well. Whereas if you think of a video, a video goes by rather quickly and you cannot see all of the details, but a photo album, you can spend time looking at the details of the picture. So. John is the one who really takes the time to get into a lot of the details. However, John does not include any parables in his writing. He does not include the Christmas story. He does not record the Lord's Supper. He does not record Jesus' baptism. But there are some interesting things that John records that none of the other writers record. We will see that there is this theme in John about life and light. And so on your sheet, number two, you will see four things that John emphasizes or lists in his book that, fill, that kind of fit into this theme of light and life. John is the only writer who records the gospel, or who, excuse me, records the miracle of Jesus changing water into wine, which I think shows this, was, this took place at a wedding, which demonstrates how Jesus wanted them to continue to celebrate life together. John is the only one who records a conversation Jesus has about uh, with Nicodemus, as Jesus tells Nicodemus that he must be born again. So this is kind of this new life, this spiritual life that we are to have. John is the only writer who records the conversation of Jesus having the conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. And Jesus says, I am living water. If you had living water, you would never go thirsty. So Jesus, again, talks about this life that we have today and this eternal life under that theme. And finally, uh, John is the only one who records 
the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, giving Lazarus physical life once again. John's gospel may appear to be uh, more spiritual than the other books, um, but John was really focused on taking the facts that Matthew, Mark, and Luke had already put out there, and instead of just recording some of those facts again, John wanted to give real meaning to those facts. Uh, John wanted to help his readers see the spiritual significance of those facts of Jesus' life that had been recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So John was actually a very good friend uh, of Jesus. In fact, you could even consider that he was uh, his best friend. There are five references in Scripture where it says, where Jesus refers to John as the disciple whom he loved. That does not mean that Jesus loved John more than any other disciples. It's just that he loved him differently. He loved him as a friend. If you recall, when Jesus hung on the cross, he said to John to please take care of my mother. And John took Mary then into his house, into his home to care, to care for her. So John tells his, his story in, in his book from the perspective as sort of being a best friend to Jesus. And, and he writes about the experience, experiences he had and, and how he remembered things. Luke spent a lot of time interviewing eyewitnesses to ensure all the facts that he had about Jesus were correct. Obviously, Matthew, being a, a disciple, experienced a lot of the events of Jesus' life uh, personally. Uh, but John just had this very close relationship with Jesus. So certainly John may know some things about Jesus that the other writers did not necessarily um, experience. You know, when Jesus went up to the top of the Mount of Transfiguration, he took Peter, James, and John. Uh, so John just had some very personal experiences of Jesus that he mentions in, uh, in his book. He provides also some, a lot of detail about the final hours before Jesus died uh, on the cross. And really, if without John's gospel, it would be very difficult to understand why there was so much opposition to Jesus and why his opponents wanted to put him to death. Certainly, the Gospel of John has had a very profound effect, I think, on people. Um, Jesus, John records that there's no other, that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to the Father except through Him. Only John records the fact that Jesus is our is our good Shepherd. He knows us by name, uh, and and so that wonderful picture we have as a shepherd who takes care uh, of sheep. But John's main purpose is to help people to understand that Jesus is God. The most popular verse in the Bible, if you ask anyone if they have a, a verse in the Bible memorized, they will often say John 3.16. So this book has really had a profound uh, effect on people. So what is the purpose of John? Question number three on your sheet. The purpose of John's book, If you, when you're in school, when you were going through different textbooks, especially if you had a math book, if you wanted to find the answers to something, where did you go looking in the book? You often went to the back. Well, to find the purpose for John's gospel, we need to go to the back. And so I would like to uh, see if I could show that to you. I want you to see the purpose of John's gospel. As you can see there on your screen from John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31, Jesus and many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. There are many things about Jesus' life that we don't know that are never recorded. Uh, what, what was Jesus like when he was growing up? What was his young adult life like before he was baptized and started his earthly ministry? We don't know. But John makes a point in, in the things that he wrote down. He wants to make sure that people believe in Jesus as their Savior, that Jesus is God. So John says, the things I've written are intended that if you understand, if you believe these things, you will have life. Uh, so again, there's that theme uh, of life uh, in, in his writings. So if you have your Bibles uh, before you, I invite you to go to John chapter 1. 
uh, verses 1 through 18. I would like to read these for you. I'm reading from the New International Version. And uh, if you would follow along, uh, we're going to read through verses 1 through 18. And then I want to focus primarily on verses 1, 2, and 3 initially. So John begins, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen this glory the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. And please note in this text, as you see John the disciple referring to John in this text, he's talking about John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist came and prepared the way for the coming of the Savior. So I'd like to start there and... uh, chapter 1, looking at verses 1, 2, and 3. And note the way that John begins his book. He begins the first three words, in the beginning. That should remind us of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, started in the same way, in the beginning. His Jewish hearers would have recognized those words right away. So John begins his gospel At the moment of creation, again, very different than the other three gospel writers because he wanted to show how not only is Jesus God, if Jesus is God, God's never had a beginning or an end. God is eternal. So he wants to show that Jesus also was eternal. He was one with his father. He was eternal with his father. So he begins with the words in the beginning to refer or to reference his hearers Back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. We also see that the word of God in Genesis 1 had tremendous power. God said, let there be, and it happened. Let there be light, and shazam, it happened. Uh, Let there be an expanse of the waters. Let there be creatures in the seas. God's word had tremendous power. When he said something, things happened. Jesus' word also has tremendous power. When he told a crippled man to get up and walk, it happened. He was able to walk. When he told Lazarus, come out of that tomb, Lazarus came out of the tomb fully alive. Jesus' words have power, just like God the Father's words did. We see that that Jesus' words still have power today in baptism. When a baptism takes place and someone pours that water on a person and says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, those words are powerful. They produce forgiveness. A person's sins are immediately forgiven with those words and the water together. 
So just as God the Father's word was very powerful, Jesus' word was very powerful. That's what John wants his hearers to understand right off the bat. In the beginning, going right back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the word. You will notice that the uh, the word, word, is capitalized in this text. Also, I would like to bring up for you, I'm going to bring up John chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3, so we can see those together. In the beginning was the word, and you will see how the W in word is capitalized to indicate this is referring to someone, like, like a person's name. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. That phrase, the word was with God, then demonstrates that Jesus is distinct from God the Father. All of the attributes that apply to God the Father are then also possessed by Jesus as well. Because it says, and the word was with God, the word being Jesus, Jesus was with God, and the word was God indicating Jesus was God. We go back to the beginning of Genesis. We see the word was was with God and the word was God. This can sound, you know, very uh, theological. This can sound um, uh, you know, just like a very deep meaning, but it's really not designed uh, uh, to be that way uh, by, any, by any means. Um, so John's just taking his, his hearers, taking his, his people back to that very beginning uh, of Genesis that they would, have, they would have known, they would have recognized as well. So in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, we see really that triune nature of God. It talks about the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, and we, it talks about the, the Word of God producing things, and it's God the Father Almighty who's doing the creating. So Jesus was, was with God, therefore he is God's, he is God's son. But being God's son uh, is actually a diff- little different than it is for us with parents and children, uh, because while son refers to a relationship, it does not refer to origins necessarily, since Jesus is eternal. So just as God the Father has always existed, Jesus has always existed, the Holy Spirit has always existed. So you see there on your sheet, I tried to highlight those four bullet points. God's word has power in creation, just as Jesus' word has power. The word was with God. John is making it very clear that Jesus was that word. And he was with God, meaning he was distinct from the Father. And yet, at the same time, he is also God. Jesus then, therefore, is the sender of the message Uh, When he came to this world, he's also the messenger himself. So Jesus sent the message to earth. Jesus um, is the messenger, and he is the message itself. Through him, verse 3, through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made. Through him emphasizes that Jesus was the agent of creation. Think creation happened through Jesus, as Jesus was there, he is God. That all happened through him. Also, we read in John chapter 1, over at verse 14, it says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Again, that was just that's John's way of emphasizing that this word, Jesus, also became a human being. So the word of God is Jesus. And when we look at this concept of the Trinity, this can certainly be uh, uh, very confusing. Because when we look at a child and a parent, a child is, is separate from their parent. But God's Son, Jesus, and the Father, while being separate, are also one being. Well, a children and a parent are not one being. But the Father and the Son are distinct, are separate, but yet they are also one being. Therefore, when we see um, one person of the Trinity, if we just see Jesus, we are actually seeing all of God. Since the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all God, and yet at the same time they are all distinct. 
Jesus said later on in the Gospel of John, I and the Father are one. And he told his disciples, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. John's point is, if you want to see God, if you want to know what God is like, then look at Jesus. So again, this, the whole concept of the Trinity can be very, uh, very complex, very challenging as we try to, to understand this. So not only did creation, God the Father did the creating, but he did the creating through Jesus. Jesus was a part of that. He wasn't just standing off watching. Creation took place through Jesus. Again, verse 3, through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So again, it's just interesting connection between uh, Jesus and the Father being distinct, but also being one at the same time. So really, these first three verses of John chapter 1 lay out three basic beliefs of Christianity. Um, and this, you'll see this on question number five on your sheet. Genesis chapter uh, 1, verses 1 through 3, lays out three basic beliefs of Christianity. Point, the first point, the word Jesus is eternal. Jesus is eternal. He does not have a beginning or an end. He has always existed with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. Second, the word Jesus is distinct from the Father. Okay? The word was with God is the in that first one that emphasizes uh, that we use as sort of that proof text to indicate that Jesus was separate from the Father. So the word Jesus is distinct from the Father. And the third point, the word Jesus is one with the Father. He's all, while he's distinct, he's also one with him. So he is God. Therefore, when we pray on a Sunday morning, I can pray to God, I can pray to Heavenly Father, I can pray to the Son, I can pray to Jesus, I can pray to the Holy Spirit. And we're praying, each one of those prayers, we're praying to the same person. So again, that, that familiar teaching, we believe in one God, but there are three people within that one God. And that's, that's difficult to, to try to compare that to anything else or anything in, in our world. It's just, it just can't really necessarily be done. So we get those three basic beliefs of Christianity. Jesus is eternal. Jesus is distinct from the Father. And Jesus is one with the Father. So he is God. If you were to take any one of those points away, you would end up getting another religion. The way it really happens, no other religion agrees with all three of those points. For example, Islam says that Jesus was a prophet. They recognize that Jesus was a real person, but they do not believe that he is God. Modern-day Judaism does not believe that Jesus is the Savior. They do not believe that Jesus is one with God. They recognize Jesus as a wonderful teacher, a loving individual, but they do not recognize him as being one with God. They do not view Jesus as the Savior. And many other religions see Jesus as a great man of wisdom, but nothing else. So if you take away any of those three basic beliefs of Christian, I think those three basic points there in question number five, take away any of those, just one of those, and you end up getting another religion. All three of those points are very, very important, and they are the basic, the, the basis for Christianity. And so John takes us back to creation to emphasize that Jesus is without beginning, without end. He was there with God the Father at creation. Creation happened through him. So Jesus, therefore, has dominion over all creation since it happened through him. Without Jesus, nothing could have been created. So he was there with the Father as that whole creation 
took place. So John lays down kind of the foundation. Who is this Jesus? As the title of the study says, he is God. He is eternal. He is one with God. And yet he is separate from God. That is, again, John uh, wanting to start this letter based on his friendship with Jesus, based on his close relationship with Jesus. He starts his book off by saying, I want you to understand that this Jesus is God. Again, a very different beginning to, uh, to his book uh, as compared to the other three gospel writers. Next, I want to go to John chapter 1. Stay there in chapter 1, and I want to go to uh, verses uh, 4 and 5 and verses 7, 8, and 9, which I will put up there for you. And it says there, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. There are those themes of light and life. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Light, life, and word are the three main themes that you will see in the Gospel of, of John. If you were to actually take a moment to count it, you will see the word life is used 47 times in the Gospel of John, and the word light is used 24 times. So Jesus is called the Word, he is called the life, he is called the light of the world. Think about, again, John chapter 3, verse 16, and, and, you can, and that aspect of life immediately comes to mind. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Okay? Nearly all of the references to life in the Gospel of John refer to eternal life. It doesn't mean our physical life is not important, but it puts our earthly life and, and our earthly work, I think, into proper perspective. Jesus came to this earth to restore our relationship with God so we could live with him. And Jesus gave his life so we could have eternal life. As we're going through this, you'll have to bear with me. I, if I'm rushing through things a bit, I, please let me know and I'll certainly try to slow down a little bit. If you have any questions, uh, you are certainly welcome to type them in uh, at this point, and I'll be happy to try to answer those as we go along. Later on in the Gospel of John, John chapter 10, uh, verse 10, again, we see this reference to uh, light and life. John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, okay? So we hear abundant life and life to the full mentioned uh, in here. So what exactly is this abundant life? What is having life to the full? What exactly does that mean? Well, again, this is intended to indicate uh, a talk about a relationships. Abundant life or life to the full involves a relationship with God. It involves a relationship with family, a relationship with friends, and a relationship with others. That's what John wants to emphasize as well with this theme of life and light. God seeks to have a relationship with all of us. And as a result of God seeking or desiring to have a relationship with all of us, I should then be motivated to seek a deeper relationship with him through worship and through prayer. We also hear in the Gospel of John how Jesus is the light, who he's, he's the light of the world, the true light that, that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He is the one who lights the way, that shows us the way to uh, heaven. 
So again, as we read this, this first chapter, especially those, that first 18 verses, those verses can really sound like a lot of poetry, uh, you could say, but that's, that's not what John intended by any means. John found a way to communicate to all people. So he, you could say he begins this in, in his, his, uh, his book by starting off, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Maybe that sounds philosophical, but so if John is writing to Greeks, that may have been a way that he was able to communicate with them to get them to listen, to engage in conversation. So he may start off that way, and he talks to Nicodemus about being born again, which can, and Nicodemus was very confused about that. He said, how, how can a person be born again? How can I get inside my mother's womb and, and to be born again? So sometimes Jesus' language might sound very uh, philosophical, but Jesus and John were looking for ways how best to communicate with people. So maybe this book starts off in a way that sounds rather philosophical, but it's not in, intended to be uh, that way by, by any means. It was intended to be uh, a way to better communicate with people. So John finds a way maybe to engage with, uh, with, with Greeks, and then John finds a way to engage uh, with, um, uh, with Jews as well. So I do see a, a question that we've, we've got coming, coming on here that I'll try to highlight for you. Um, so was John writing with such a different approach and state of purpose because of things going on at that time he wrote it? That is certainly, that, that is certainly uh, a, probably a, a big part of what um, John wrote to his book probably about in, in the year 85 is what most scholars will believe. Mark wrote his, his book in the early 50s or maybe early 60s. Luke wrote his, excuse me, uh, Matthew wrote his uh, book also in, in the early 60s. Luke wrote around the 60s and 70s, and John wrote around the year 85. So it took place several years later after Matthew, Mark, and Luke had written their books. And certainly, um, maybe John was seeing the things that were happening. How do I better engage with people based on some things that were happening at the time? If uh, maybe he didn't think people were um, learning and understanding more about Jesus from what Matthew, Mark, and Luke had written, John was then looking for a different way to then communicate uh, with the people at that time. So certainly uh, it could have been some things that may have been happening uh, just were not happening at the time with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so John took a very different approach with that uh, as well. Um, Let's see. And certainly with, with John wanting to um, communicate with people, as I said, uh, he starts with the words in the beginning. So those are words that Jews would have recognized right away um, since they would have known the scriptures. So um, he starts, so with those words, that's his way of connecting with Jews and, and writing with his style could have been his way of connecting with Greeks. And this is something we all do in our lives as we seek to try to communicate with one another. We, tr we try to uh, find different ways to communicate with people, to help people understand um, who is this Jesus, the relationship we have with Jesus. So all four gospel writers take a, a very different approach as to the experiences they had with Jesus, how they saw Jesus, and how they wanted to communicate with people um, who, this, who this Jesus is. So again, Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience, so he includes more of the Old Testament prophecies and miracles than any of the other writers. Uh, Luke did not want to get into a lot of the details of uh, the genealogy, the Christmas story. Again, I'm sure he just felt that it, that was already out there. And uh, or excuse me, Mark didn't want to uh, get into all of that. He wanted to get right to the action to show that Jesus was, was indeed the Savior and goes through the events of his life, parables, miracles, uh, and some other things. In fact, half of Mark's book focuses just on the last week of Jesus' life. And so uh, Mark, again, goes to the action uh, with the things that Jesus did, and then he kind of slows down and focuses on the last week of, of Jesus' life uh, in his book. Luke was 
took his writings from talking to a number of eyewitnesses to ensure that the things he knew and understood about Jesus indeed were correct and to help his friend Theophilus to understand uh, who that Jesus was indeed the Savior of the world. So Luke's is a very long, very detailed gospel as he contained a lot of details, uh, wrote a lot of details from the eyewitness accounts that he had with others. And then John taking that different approach, connecting with Greeks and with Jews to help people understand that Jesus is indeed God. He's one with God. Creation took place through him, but he's also distinct from God as well. That Jesus is the word. The word of God had power in creation. Jesus' word has power today. So God, so John uses those words, calls Jesus the word to indicate that indeed he is the say that, that, that the word is Jesus. And in verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Next time, what we will do, we will go and look at Jesus' miraculous birth. And we will look specifically the details that, that Matthew and the details that Luke put there in the birth of Jesus. Usually uh, on Christmas Eve, when we go through the story of Jesus' birth, we'll read it either from Matthew or we will read it from Luke. And we will look at those details next time as to, again, who is this Jesus? John's main point with our title today, G Christ Jesus is the Word. He is the Word of God. He is God. And next time we want to look at Jesus' miraculous birth uh, that took place, the angels that were involved, how God at just the right time, after 400 years of silence, after the Old Testament was, was completed, you know, out of the blue when no one expected it, uh, in this small town, the Savior uh, is born, takes place. And so we're going to look next time at the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. You will see those two chapters written there at the end of your sheet of paper. Please join me in a word of prayer as we close today. Oh Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you and praise you that you indeed uh, came to be one of us. You dwelt among us to better understand us. And we thank you that indeed uh, you are a, a wonderful, loving, graceful, and powerful God. We thank you for these gospel writers who share their insights with us that we may better know you so that we may have life and have it to the full with you, with our families and friends, and with others around us. Bless us now this day in our service to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with me today.